Meaning, once you see it happen in the Bible the first time, it can it keeps going on over and over. When they have tides the first time, it continues over and over. When they when Jesus died on the cross, he set a precedent for all of us that we no longer have to offer blood sacrifices in the shape of animals to the Lord. Amen. Whenever something's done for the first time, it always sets something present. Um, and it usually means we have to change. And I don't know about you, I do not like change. Change means it's uncomfortable. Change means things happen without you wanting it to happen. And usually it happens because of things out of your control. But there's change you can believe in. <laughs> Not the promise of a political speaker. Not the promise of a guy looking good in a three-piece suit telling you that when he is elected, change will happen. No, change happens because God makes it happen. Change happens because God is directing the whole earth into this one direction where there, you see the division between good and evil, where you see that things are being more apparent. There is a line that is being drawn. And the end, it comes to Jesus coming back and saving everyone. One more time, he will come back and save us all. So before, we get, before I get into that, let's read um, the passages. It, um, it's going to be in the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. I'm going to be reading from the voice version. You probably have a different version, and it's perfectly fine. But this, I'm going to read from what I have. And it says, my brothers and sisters, I cannot address you as people who walk by the Spirit, I have to speak to you as people who trend to think merely human terms, as spiritual infants in the Anointed One. I nursed you with milk as a mother would feed her baby, because you are not, and still are not, developed enough to digest complete, uh, complex spiritual food. And here's why you are still living in the flesh, not in the Spirit. How do I know? Are you fighting with one another? Are you comparing yourselves to others and becoming consumed with jealousy? Then it sounds like you're still living in the flesh, no different from the rest who live by the standards of this rebellious and broken world. If one of you is saying, I am with Paul, and the other one is saying, I am with Apollos, aren't you like everyone else? So who is Apollos really, or Paul for that matter? Our, we are only servants, agents who led you to faith, and the Lord commissioned each of us to do a particular job. My job was to plant the seed, and Apollos was called to water it. Any growth comes from the Lord. So the ones who water and plant have nothing to brag about. God who causes the growth is the only one who matters. The one who plants is no greater than the one who waters. Both will be rewarded based on their work. And we are gardeners, field workers, laboring with God, who are the, who you are the vineyard, the garden, the house where God dwells. Change is going to happen. In 2015, you're going to experience a lot of change. And um, I'm going to break it down to five different things before, before I really get into it. So you understand what I mean by change. Because in 2015, we're just in the beginning. And we have all these, all these expectations, all these hopes that we want to have happen. Like, I'm going to work out every week from this point forward. I'm going to eat less junk food, eat out less. I broke that already. <laughs> I broke that already. <laughs> Done. I promise not to get angry at people anymore. Ugh, that's a hard one. I promise to, you know, get to work on time. Things like that. These are things that we're trying to hope for, but in the end, there's things that change that are not in your control. And I'm going to break it down to you. Uh, the first one is identity. Your identity changes. There's a problem when you identify yourself with a position. 
or a role in a church. If you believe that your identity relies on your role in the church, then when it's taken away, you feel like you have no identity. So let's say I am a worship leader. And then God says, now I'm going to take you out of being a worship leader and I'm going to put you to a different ministry. If my identity relies on just me worshiping on the Lord and that's taken away, I feel like I lost my identity. That's not what it's about. If your identity relies on your job, oh, I'm, I'm a sales manager at this place, but then you take the identity away, you lose your job. Does that mean that you've lost your identity? No. Your identity has to be coming something farther and greater than just your position. The next thing that's going to change is your economics. This we have no control over. You might have a great job right now, but in the turn of a moment, the, econ the economy can change and can lose your job in an instant. It can happen. If you're in sales, you see that all the time. Especially in Silicon Valley, in a place that is filled by technology, and when technologies change, and businesses don't keep up, they, they have to lay off people. Economy changes. Your job changes. I experienced that already. I had to go from a sales world to a desk job. And I miss selling sometimes. Because there's a lot of money in selling cars when you're good at it. But the cost of selling cars meant that I had to work six days a week, including Saturdays. And then when God called me to ministry, I made the very hard choice to walk away from that money. And it's hard to walk away from money, especially when you're used to making so much of it. And when you're used to being able to eat red lobster twice a week versus twice a month. Oh, wait, two times a month, oh, whatever. You get what I'm talking about. Comfort zone. When change happens, you become uncomfortable. You are forced to do things out of your control. God calls you to reach out to the homeless, and you're afraid to meet them, but God's still calling you to it. You're called to do public speaking, to preach, and you're scared of public speaking. I tell you this much, public speaking is probably one of the worst fears, worst um, per uh, perceived fears in the human mind. You will be stretched. You will be asked to do things that are uncomfortable for you. And the next one is status. People are afraid to give up status. People are afraid to give up a standing in a society or in a ministry when God calls them to do something else. People are afraid to, ch to let go of that status when God's calling them to do something else. And the last one is how God's kingdom works. What I mean by that, the principles don't change. The word doesn't change, amen. But the method how it's delivered cha can change. With worship, in the big, there's a generation that's used to hymnals. There's a new generation that's, that's used to this kind of worship right now. There's a generation that's growing that's probably going to have a style of worship that my generation and the past generation have no idea how they came to that, but that's how they want to worship. We, we have to learn how to adjust to the method because sometimes we rely too much on the method than the God who provided the method in the first place. And when the method changes, we cannot be afraid to adapt to it because it's not about being comfortable. It's about doing the Lord's work. In the end, it's about flesh and spirit. Um, what I read, it was, not, it was originally, go ahead. This was written to believers who are in the church already. In the book of Corinthians was not written to people that are non-believers. Paul wrote this to the church, a very fleshly church, in matter of fact. If you look, look at the background of the Corinthians, they were fleshly. And he was trying to change a church that was so into the world and convert them slowly. Okay, don't get this wrong. This is a church that, act, that believes in God. 
that understands God's, Jesus and the cross and salvation. But the problem is that they were still stuck in this earthly uh, thought process. And Paul's letter, this first letter to the Corinthians, he was really being harsh to them. Because he was there, he left, and he's hearing all these things still happening. And he's saying to them, my brothers and sisters, I cannot address you as people who walk in the spirit. I have to speak to you as people who think who merely, in merely human terms, as spiritual infants in the anointed one. He's speaking to a church that's still in, they're still drinking formula versus eating steak. Does that make sense? He's addressing a church that has not grown in its maturity yet. And he's being harsh to them. In a loving way, he means well, but he has to be just upfront about it. Okay, and which brings to my question to you right now, from t last year, 2014, where do you stand in your growth? You had all of New Year's, like the past week to think about it. I thought about it. Where have I grown in 2014? What did I do, what I did not do? What did I fail to do? Oh, no. Am I still doing the same things last year that I'm doing this year? Have you grown? And I tell you this, you cannot move on unless you're willing to change. For you personally, the hardest thing for people to do is change. And Paul's calling out in a letter right now that you have to change, you have to mature in your faith. You cannot just be spiritual infants anymore. There is a world out there that looks at the church and says, you're no different than I am. And they're right. They are right. We have to look ourselves in the mirror and say, I understand that I am like them, but I need to change to be a parent to show them the difference that has God has done in my life. But then he breaks it down even more. He goes down to these three sections in this, in this passage. And he says these, these three things. The first thing he says, you're still, how do, you, how do I know? Are you fighting with one another? Strife. Are you comparing yourselves to others and becoming consumed with jealousy? And the last one is the vision. Okay. Let me break this down. The enemy doesn't fight on the outside. He fights in the inside. He's smart. He's cunning. His goal, his goal in life is to cause division. His goal in life is to, to divide. And his goal in life is to stumble people, especially when they're about to start having momentum in ministry. Oh, keep it there, keep it there. <laughs> go back, go back, go back, go back. We don't want to talk about that yet, not yet. <laughs> okay. Strife, are you fighting with one another? I'll tell you this much, there's nothing wrong with arguments. Arguments are normal. Married couples, is arguments normal? That's so quiet. <laughs> Siblings, do arguments happen? Yes? Yes, okay. But when you let the arguments cause division between you two versus learning how to grow from the argument and become stronger together, that's where the problem is. That's where flesh comes in. Jealousy. This one's a hard one. Because sometimes we want to compare each other. Especially in the Filipino culture, I don't know where it came from. But in my family, when the aunts and uncles get together, they start talking, my son, he got oles this semester. And then my mom would look at me like, my son only got bees. I don't know how to top that. Or... or um, you know, especially during graduation, my son, my daughter has magna cum laude. I have nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I just passed. I have a paper. Now, if you take this too personally, especially when it comes to your walk, you get frustrated why in your, in your life things aren't happening the way you want. And then someone else's life, it's like, it looks like they're having like the greatest time in the, in the world, they're happy, they're go lucky. Why is this guy getting blessed with a promotion? Why is this guy, this guy being blessed with a new car? My car is about to break down. And I lost a tire. This guy, he just got a free tire. I don't know. There's things. When you walk your life and things are down, especially when you're down, can you attest to this? And you see someone else all happy and you're like, can you just shut up? <laughs> Internally, you mean that. But inside, you, you know what the problem is that? Is that you're comparing what God's doing in your life to someone else where God's customized his walk. The problem is that my walk is different from your walk because God is dealing with my issues versus your issues. And how it's developed changes on a personal level. And cause I, because when in my walk, I understand economics or something, but I still am addressing something else in my life doesn't mean that your walk's any, any better. Someone that looks like they're happy is probably dealing with something far more worse than you are when you're dealing with something publicly. I tell you this much. Sometimes when I look at couples that I look too happy, I go like, they're fighting. There's an argument going on. They're uh, hiding it. I could call it out all day. I'm sorry. Um, but when it comes to comparing your walk, you're not supposed to. You'll, you stay in your lane and let, let God work out your life. And let God walk, work out their life. It's not up to you. It's up to God. And then there's this thing called division. Because you if you've seen the, the last part of this chapter, or this last part of the verses I read, it talks about Paul and Apollos. Paul started something in Corinthians. Apollos followed up with it. And then in the church, they have this division because one says, I'm with Paul. The other one says, I'm with Apollos. Now, Paul's intention was not to cause that in the first place. If you read down the line, all he really wanted to do was just grow the church. All he really wanted to do was just grow the church. But then, out of accident, whether he understood it or not, there was a division because they're, they're talking about who did better work, Paul or Apollos. But then Paul breaks it down right there. He says, So who is Apollos really, or Paul for that matter? We are only servants, agents who led you to faith. And the Lord commissioned each of us to do a particular job. My job was to plant the seed, and Apollos was called to water it. Any growth comes from God. So the ones who water and plant have nothing to brag about. God who causes the growth is the one who matters. The one who plants is no greater than the one who waters. Both will be rewarded based on their work. The issue sometimes in ministry, because we go from this argument to this jealousy to this division, it escalates more and more. When it, what really matters is that we're us all doing the Lord's work. And sometimes God will call you to do something that you're used to last year and bring you to ministry to do something entirely different this year. And you have to be ready for it. You cannot be hung up on your status. You cannot be hung up on your comfort zone. And it doesn't, and you know, you cannot allow the public point of view affect your ministry. I mean, the pulpit, this is a very public ministry. Going to someone's house and praying for them in their most vulnerable, hardest moment in their life, that's not public. And that's usually something shared between two people, two, three people. That's ministry too. Both of them have big importance to the work of God. When you start saying that the pulpit work is more important than the prayer work, that's the problem. When you're saying that the worship is more important than the people counting the money, then there's a problem. When the person greeting at the door isn't considered help. When cleaning the church isn't considered greater, then there's a problem with the way the church works. 
the work is for the church, not for yourself. Okay, we all work for the church, God's work, under LBFC's banner, because we're this is the church we decided to choose ourselves to be associated with. But we're still under God's church. Everything big and small is important to the Lord's work, from the presentation of how the church works to doing the dirty work. All of that is important in the Lord's eyes. And I tell you this much, the more public it is, the harder it is usually, because you deal with more repercussions later. Um, let me talk to you about this church called Mars Hill. This actually is a fairly large church in Seattle. It was started by this man named uh, Mark Driscoll. He established it in 1996, and he grew it to 13 churches and satellite sites in five states. But in 2014, October, Mark Driscoll resigned as head pastor of that church. And as of January 1st, 2015, all the churches became independent. What happened in that church? There was an issue between the leadership and its peop congregation. The problem is that Mark Driscoll didn't want to change his style. Mark Driscoll didn't want to change his style of leadership. It was quoted, it's in an article. They concluded Driscoll has been guilty of arrogance responding to conflict with quick temper and harsh speech and leading the staff and elders to a domineering manner, but has never been charged with any immorality, legality, or hearsay. Most of the charges involve attitudes and behaviors reflected by a domineering style of leadership. They were not calling Mark Driscoll immoral or doing something biblically wrong. He refused to change how he responded to his church. And all the work he had from 1996 to 2014 was drastically changed. Imagine that. You had 13 churches that you started. And you're leading all these people. But because of something you weren't willing to change, God took it away. Because of, because of strife, because of jealousy, and because of division from both sides. It, I'll tell you this much. A relationship is two sides. Amen. Something happened with Mark Driscoll's side, and something happened with the deacons board in the church. Between those two, something happened. And they could not resolve it. And it had to come to a point where Mark had to resign. And the consequence is that 13 churches had to be born from what used to be one. This was on the news. Uh, if, you, if, you're under, if you're into like hearing church news and stuff, this was a big thing last year. Because Mark, he's biblically sound. He has a good ministry. He has a good heart. But because of the way he chose to handle something or some things, it caused division and it caused him to lose a church, lose his, what God has given him in the first place. Now it's, now it's splintered up. Change was happening. Change was forced. Now, how do you counter all that division? How do you counter all of that? We start off with harmony. Can you get along despite your differences? Is it okay to agree to disagree? Can you agree to disagree? You can still work with someone in ministry. You can work with someone in a job and still disagree in minor things. But if it's for the Lord, it shouldn't matter. It should not matter. Contentment. Oh, can you accept what has God's given you? Can you say... The Lord giveth and take it away, even though I have a minimum wage job. The Lord didn't take it away, even though I did not go to the school I wanted to go to. Can I be content that God took that guy or girl away from me? Ooh, I felt that. 
Can you be content in your situation despite how it looks like right now? Can you be content and accept where you are and still praise God and still cheer on somebody else who's growing in their life? Because there's a lot of people here growing in their life, but if we're stuck in ourselves, thinking about ourselves only, and are not cheering this person on because they're growing, they're changing in their life, well, then you're not a unified church. Okay. And of course, I'm talking about unity. Are, we, are you listening to the same God I'm listening to? Are you listening to the same God I'm listening to? Usually, what clears all of this, though, is, is something that we tend to have an issue with because it's so, it sounds so simple, but yet so hard to do. And as I wait for uh, Koyukiko to change the slide. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, Koyukiko. Didn't mean that in a bad way. It's forgiveness. To overcome the flesh, you must understand forgiveness. People will make mistakes. And stay right there first. Quick, you go. Forgiving others. Where is it? In the, I don't have the verse in front of me, but it's, it's, it's hard to forgive. It's really hard to forgive especially when it is justified. Especially when it's justified. When someone's hurt, hurt you intentionally, you are justified to be angry. But God says, no, you must forgive. You must let go. You turn the other cheek. And in fact, God says, love on them. Pursue them. Be their friend. Walk the extra mile with them. And that's hard. That's really hard. Because it means you give up pride, you give up ego, you give up the right to be, you give up the right to be right. All the things that can come to vision usually starts with you first. And you giving it up. And then things can happen. But this in itself is probably the hardest thing. And it's to forgive yourself. Let me tell you something about my walk. When I start, first started understanding that this idea that Jesus loves me, that, this, that Jesus died for my sins, I understood that, but I could not accept it. I understood that Jesus died for my sins, but I couldn't accept it. Because I understood God forgave me, but I couldn't forgive myself for the things I've done. Whether it, because of my past, because of my mistakes. And that tends to be the reason why I cannot grow in these other parts of my life, because I could not forgive myself. Because I caused strife, because I was jealous, because I caused division. Can you tell you something right now? By you saying that I can't forgive myself for what I've done, it's, and you're a believer, it's saying that what Jesus did in the cross was not good enough for you. It's saying that what Jesus did in the cross, everything he's endured for me, wasn't good enough for me, for my sins. That's a very selfish thought process. It is a very selfish thought process, and it bleeds into everything else. Until you can understand that Jesus did it despite of you. Jesus did it because he truly does love you with no pretense, no conditions. then you could probably start the year off right and deal with these issues of the, the strife, the jealousy, and the division. Once you learn to forgive yourself, because God already forgave you, why are you holding it up? 
One of the hardest things in my personal life was learning how to forgive uh, my father. Mostly because how I perceived how, how he, wanted, how he um, wanted to take care of me. If you didn't know, my parents were divorced. And during my childhood, I had a lot of anger. I didn't realize I had it back then, but when in my 20s, I realized I had a lot of anger against my father. And I had to learn how to let it go and forgive him. And I tell you this much, it's still not easy <laughs> to love on my father for what he does still. But I still choose to forgive him, and I still choose to love him, despite what the mistakes he's made. Are you ready for the change? It's written, it's in Isaiah 40, it says, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, or, a voice of one calling, in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight the desert, a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground should become level. The rugged pieces are plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed. And all people will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. This is, of course, talking about Jesus Christ coming. But it's also a personal calling for you. Are you ready? Are you ready to prepare the way of the Lord into your life, 2015? Are you ready to forgive people in 2015? Are you ready to stop the division and start thinking of unification in God's work? We have to prepare the way. Not because of, not because of keeping a status quo, but because God's calling us to change. And whatever the change may be, we must choose to accept it embrace it and move forward with it together as one family.